sports ecology. So the, the working teams, right now we're working on a 3D printer. So the first thing we want to do is, uh, so right now I've got a small team of people working on a project. And the question already is arising, how do we work together? How do we uh, do the open source product development where there's a lot of people working and you got to orient everybody to make sure everybody knows where everything is. I'm trying to record this here. Okay, here we go, better. I can show you guys there. Okay. Um, big question is how do we, so so in this project, uh, we've got the working teams, the OSC developers as a, as a core, core part of the development team, shifting over from the more ad hoc development we, we've done all the time to get a really focused, nice focused effort. So that starts with meetings. You know, we got our Monday meeting. We have the working team that does does the product. We got Richard here. He's he's our HR generalist in training. So we're going to start interviewing people this week. Emmanuel is working already on the 3D printer since a couple of weeks. We've got another guy, and Jonathan should be joining us. But once the assets, like okay, the goal is to to recruit one or two new people per week, and it's happening right now. By the end of the year, we want to have 12 teams of 12 pairs. So that's either 144 or 288 people. But imagine that it's like our, our private club or open private club, but our, our clan or our tribe of people that are really going forward on the open source product development. So once we get more and more people going, the question is how do you find everything, right? So I'm gonna go through that real quick. So so first of all, there's, you like in order to find out, I'm gonna share my screen, um, okay. To find out everything that's going on in the project, you need to know two things. One, so we've got the wiki. That's where we operate, opensourceecology.org slash wiki. Everything is on a wiki. So the two things you really need to know is the page called development template. And on it, we have two main... Why is this not going forward? No, let me back that up. Okay, development template shown graphically here, which shows all the things that we develop on, starting from things like background reading, background research, how it works, um, requirements, 3D CAD, like 3D CAD is core, Bills of materials, fabrication drawings, language agnostic instructionals, to name a few of the assets that we develop. Okay, so you got to know this, that there's a name for everything that we develop. So, for example, it would be the 3D printer BOM or tractor BOM or, you know, functional diagram, uh, 3D printer functional diagram or tra tractor functional diagram. So if you type those words in the wiki upstairs, you should be able to find it. So, for example, um, start with... Okay, so that's so that's the nomenclature. You have a defined taxonomy for what everything is called. Like people invented language, like what, 10,000 years ago? That's a good invention. Now we have wikis and an immediate ability to communicate everything worldwide. And that means we can have unprecedented ability to collaborate if we know the language, so to say, right? Let's carry on the tradition from 10,000 years ago. Now, okay, so, th so the first page of that is we develop on a technology level, but the second main point is we develop on the enterprise level. That means we develop all the different assets that help somebody set up an enterprise building something or, uh, or, or something related, whether it's like building 3D printers, where it's a 3D printer uh, parts printing business or a tractor production business or an agricultural, turnkey agricultural greenhouse or whatever that is. Okay, so that's the one page, the development template page. The second page you need to know is the modules what all exists in the GVCS so let me get to that okay I don't have it here so modules so we go to a page on the wiki called GVCS module so we're working on a global village construction set modules so the GVCS has 50 machines and they're each further broken down into modules, about 10 modules or so each. Every single one of them is listed on this GVCS modules page. So if you go to GVC modules, you can see tractor, blah, 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 power cube, bulldozer. Somewhere down the road is gonna be a 3D printer. Um, somewhere down, I'll scroll down to the 3D printer. 
and then you have the names of the the modules that make up that specific item so 3d printer for example okay number 46 in the list well we should probably move it up because it's the thing we're working on right now but 3d printer so it's got things like the frame universal axis extruder heated bed controller so forth so the point is that if you go to 3d printer so these are this is a list of the, all the modules and each of them should have a wiki page so for example if you go to a page called if i type in 3d printer what do we find there well the 3d printer right great so then we go to like once we find that we we can also go to that's oh, okay i gotta scroll the way back down there again um i mean Oh, it's kind of pain in this here. I'm scrolling all the way back down to the to the 3D printer, but then you want to see a sub module of the 3D printer, like because we break everything down into modules, so it's easier to work on. So we go to 3D printer and frame, or extruder. Let's say extruder. There should be a page on the wiki called 3D printer extruder, but because the 3D printer has different versions, like we already did some work on the 3D printer a few years ago in like 2014. Oh. Uh, 2013 last year so what we want to do is understand that there's different versions of the 3d printer it has a genealogy right so when we go to the 3d printer page we first have to go which version we're working on because as we're gonna see like if we go through rapid prototyping we're gonna get to new versions on a rapid basis you know every three months let's say and then how do people know which is the current one so you have to orient people first because we're we're working in time we're working in modules, we're working over 50 machines, and there are many modules. So so it gets complicated. And we've had this collapse a number of times in Your history. Audio's breaking up. My audio's breaking up? How badly? Yeah, just a little bit. It's very bad, Marcin, I can't hear you. Though. Really? Well, okay, so if you lost a lot of this, then the good thing is I'm actually recording this, so... Uh, you can view the video tonight. Just review it. But but we got to be all on the same page as far as how to how to navigate. So any of the items we're working on, like like first of all, 500 modules over many versions. Over um, it's basically 500 modules over many versions. Right. So that's. 50, 50 machines, 10 modules that gets you to 500. Many versions, like at least three, like on a CEB press, we're like on version eight, but say three nominally. So that's 1,500 items. Okay, but then you've got the development template, which is a, every single development point of an item where you've got another 100 or so things. So you're talking about 150,000, that's... 150,000 items that that you need to be tra able to track over over well over you know if you if you want to know what's like if you want to be the the heavyweight product manager right like like I am that right now I know where I can find every single asset on the project that's that's developed but the theory is simple you look at the development template you understand the name of the machine through the through the modules list where did that modules list go I'm going to put that right here. So so you understand the development template, template, you understand the module spreadsheet, and then you can type into the, the, the wiki the name of that thing, like, for example, 3D printer frame or extruder. Here I know that the for the 3D printer, if I go to 3D printer, I go to the look for the genealogy as the first thing because that shows you what versions have already happened. So here in the genealogy on a 3D printer page, 3D printer is the general name of this, right? Th machine, right? But right now we're working on what's known as D3D, which we're calling that, which is the distributed enterprise 3D printer. That's what we're calling it. And um, it's like version three, but since it has a specific name, it's easy to start using that by looking at the genealogy. So we go to D3D, and that's that's okay. That's our D3D development. We've got a critical path, all the different, uh, the meeting log, and so forth. But let me go back to like okay. Say you wanna. We know we've been working on an extruder. Uh, you know, the last few last week, 
actually. Uh, or actually two weeks ago. We started an extruder, we worked at, on, on that for a week, and then we want to find where that is. So how do you find the extruder on the wiki? It's going to be under D3D extruder. <laughs> yeah, it is. So without, you know, like if you know the, once again, if you know the module breakdown, and if you know the template, then you can find the extruder on the wiki. Okay? Um, what happened here? So I was on the right. So I was on the on the modules page. So you can think about that for every single thing in the set, like three D, uh, like for example, the tractor uh, frame. You'll type in tractor first of all to look at the genealogy. You know, type in tractor. You'll see that it gets you to the tractor page, life track, so forth. And then you can go like tractor, for example, frame. Now, I don't think it's set up right now, is it? Actually, there is some information on the frame, so that, that's what came up. But basically, any single asset should be able to findable like that. But here, I violated what I just told you. I, I just said tractor frame. Well, we should be talking about particular tractor version frames. So, for example, if it's live track 6, we would say live track 6 frame, etc. But you get the general notion. Know the language. And know the know the modules, and that's it. Then you can find just about anything. Okay, so now let's let's talk about a couple more details of how we collaborate. So say you can find any single aspect, right? Well, there's uh, there's more in terms of the the communication channels of how we collaborate. So first is people have work logs, so you can find anybody's work um, by Going to the logs page, for example, you can see project logs, like for example, D3D log, which is what we're currently working on. And then there's um, like work logs, like Palamides log, that's that's actually Emmanuel's log right there. But everyone keeps logs, so if you know who's working on a team, then you can find their log and you can know what's what's going on. So that's, that's the work log. Today, for example, we are gonna go to the D3D log and that's used to allocate tasks to different people. I click on D3D and we have the meeting from Monday, February 6th. So we would edit that and we say Monday, February 20. And we, we, we would actually list. So Monday, Feb, Feb 20, 2017. And we can edit this all together. One person can, for example, edit, you know, say we're developing the plan for the week because th that's the Monday meeting. We can. Uh, edit that right here in real time. So for example, we'll allocate tasks like Richard, for example. We're going to interview two people this week, at least. Um, and then some other tasks, etc. You write down specifically what your tasks are. So Emmanuel. Um, we're going to do um, either continue working on, a, we'll discuss that, but either on the frame or on the controller part, because there's works to do there. There's Jonathan, you know, whatever Jonathan's gonna do. There's Brian who joined the team. Um, and there's there's Marchin. So basically, who you are the chosen crew here so far in a sense that you all have passed or are in training, uh, but passed have passed the FreeCAD exam. That's what what's required to become on a come on a team because the FreeCAD work is really crucial to a lot of the work that we do here. Okay, so that's the meeting log for the Monday meeting. We've got our work log. So for example, on the meeting log, what we should also have up there is um, a way to list all the players on the team currently. So we can say um, Marchin log, uh, comma, Jonathan log, Brian log. Uh, I'll say Manuel. No, u, il, log. Stuff like that. So, so you can find what what all the work is that's that's existing on a project. Like for example, you look at Manuel log, and you see what he's doing. He's uploading all his FreeCAD files and so forth, the 3D print files that we've been working on, etc. So that's the logs page. Um, D3D, so D3D log, that's where we uh, keep track of all that's going on. Okay, next, next item. Let's talk about the mines 
social network uh, or the, the open source ecology network. We have just, this is in beta testing right now, but this is our new social network. Uh, it's a fully open source network called based on a, what's called the Minds platform. And the idea there is um, privacy and open source. So this is not malware. You're not getting snooped on. Uh, you control the finances or whatever, the data on this website. So this is our open source website. Now, Facebook, what's the role of Facebook? We have a page called the Open Source Ecology Workshops page. So that's where we typically post. But right now what we'd like to do is whenever we post something, so we have a group actually set up as the 3D printer development group right here. So this is a group only the team members can contribute to that. Anyone can see it, but only the team members can post here. Uh, this is for the development team. But here, basically, you have a share to. Like, when you, whenever you write a post, we should just share it to Facebook. And then, I don't know if we can... Sh we'll, we'll have to make it such that we can share it directly to the, to the workshops group, because that's where we communicate, like, a lot of the development and st instead of the main OSC page. You don't want to, like have all the development work going to the main OSC page. But minds, okay, so whenever we, we have issues, like we're working on stuff, communicate here. It's like our forum. Um, we could either do a forum or a social network. Forum is cool, anybody can, can collaborate and so forth, but forum takes management. We might end up working with a forum sometime in the future, but right now, I mean, we've had a forum, it's kind of died off in a sense that it needs management to be meaningful, otherwise it's kind of all over the place. So we want to do a tight, you know, our tight development here where, if, say we have a question like, okay, what do we do today? What do we do next with the frame? You know, post it. That's, you know, we communicate here and then we can, you know, edit that, respond to that. Uh, so we can communicate like any issues that we have. This is our log that's live and visible to everybody. It's kind of nicely formatted as opposed to just our, our work logs that we work with, you know, like marching log here. It's like, who wants to look at this bunch of text? Like, look at my log. I've got a bunch of links to all bunch of different stuff. Um, well, the, the, the network itself is a really nice, nice thing to do. Like, for example, here I, I told people that, hey, we actually have these files available for the the... Prusa i3 extruders so we can print them out and prototype them. I just found that they actually did update those files, Emmanuel, so we could, we could actually um, use that. But um, yeah, let's get to that later. So that's the OSC network. If you miss where that is, just go to the Open Source Ecology Wiki and just go to OSC network and you'll find a link to that there uh, as well. Next item. Uh, so I showed you like, okay, you can find anything like the 3D printer. Okay, uh, there's the D3D page. So let's talk about the development page for the 3D printer right now. So that's the main overview page. If you scroll down a little bit, you have to get to the module breakdown because we do modular design, right? So if you go to the modules, you see, okay, extruder, frame, etc. right? So, so the main page, D3D, gets you to all the sub-modules. So you can click on them, like D3D extruder. You click on that, like here and you get to the extruder. So for example, if this week we're working on a, on a controller, there's gonna be another link there for the, the controller. And typically what we do is we embed a working Google Doc, which um, is basically a multi-page document where you can do put in images, put in text, and you can edit that. Uh, everyone on a team has access to editing this. Like, you, like the sharing on this is actually, this is an open document. You don't have to log in or anything to be able to edit this. So anyone on a team can edit this. So think about down the road, we've got hundreds of people collaborating. You know, just to add people to a document would take a bunch of overhead. So just open it up, you know. Well, here actually we have it can find and view. So actually I'll change that uh, in the settings to say anyone can find and edit. So you save that. And um, then any, this is open to the world for editing. And that's... And typically that's that's fine because nobody messes with these documents. Sometimes I back them up, but we've never had any problems with peop with people trashing our documents because they're open. So it works really well. So, um, so I mentioned the meeting log. Let's talk about the roadmaps and critical paths, just like a more more general thing. Like the overall roadmap is on a roadmap page. You can see the overall milestones for um, all kinds of projects for OSC. There's a um, 
there's a critical path. So from a roadmap, you get into a critical path. Like what exactly are we actually doing right now? Uh, you find that on the critical path page on a wiki. And here, basically, you can see that what's going on. Like right now, we're preparing for the 3D printer workshop. We're going to get to the CNC torch table in June, heavy duty CNC machining in July. And then in August, we're going to spawn a bunch of heavy construction machines. And then towards the end of the year, um, if I could move this, towards the end of the year, there's uh, I don't know, there's a lot of critical paths here, but towards the end of the year, so that's our building a lot, bunch of machines, September, um, October, we're going to do a, um, a small workshop on a mini, like a mini house build, that's what we're looking at, and then Seed Eco Home 2 build towards the end of October. And actually, later in December, we're looking at a big, big 3D printer workshop where we get 100 3D printers built in a single day. So we're, we're getting ready for that. So that's why the, we're developing the 3D printer, and it's, it's good so far. So that's the critical path. What are our priorities? How do you find the priorities of OSC? Well, clearly, on OSC priorities wiki page. Uh, so if I come up, go to development priorities, what are the development priorities? Uh, if I could spell it. So here's an overview of the development priorities. So between the development priorities, OSC roadmap, and critical path, you can see what's going on in the project at any time. So for example, if someone's interested in collaborating, well, we um, we see if it's it's fit and fitting with our priorities. Because we only have so many people, we only have so much effort. It's not this ad hoc, we kind of like uh, take something on because somebody came along on a project. No, we plug in people to existing work because we've seen that if we work in an ad hoc fashion nothing gets done over the long term there's not the continuity aspect that's that's critical to the to the operation so okay so one of the last things is uh things like in an open source project you want to have a bug tracker we want to install that later on but on a but in the meantime on the wiki we have a page called bug tr bug tracker uh where we simply use this review form to keep track of bugs um that's that's going to become much more important down the road when there's a lot of different projects, lots of different uh, elements we're keeping track of. You want to have a good bug tracker to know what the issues, the current working issues are on all the projects. So, and then the last thing is the OSC developers page, human resources. We're inviting OSC developers, so whoever's watching this, sign up to be an OSC developer, um, uh, fill out the application, and join the teams and you'll be invited to these Monday Monday working meetings where the main requirement is passing the OSC FreeCAD test, test where you do demonstrate that you have basic profession proficiency in FreeCAD and, and video editing so you can communicate your work effectively through CAD and through videos and through logging. So that's that's basically it on the development path maybe any questions from you guys like how this works like basically it's the deal is we're supposed to be able to find anything that we're working on and kind of orient ourselves on the whole project um, if we understand the structure of the project. So that's kind of like the main um, main idea here. Any questions before I go further? Uh, well, can, you, uh, can you try to reduce the bandwidth results? Yeah, I mean, we get the, uh, yeah, to do that, I'll stop the, stop the screen share and uh, I'll cut out my cut out my um it's the top button next to the settings top button next to the settings uh, oh wow you see the... right so go limit bandwidth um low very low audio only okay how about this would this work is this any better now it works so far Okay. Yeah, it yeah, doesn't. I, I, well, I think both of us lost you for a while. Okay. Well, it's recorded on um, on this, so if you wouldn't mind looking at this again, just to kind of get the whole overview of how the development process works, because think about this: like once we get so many people on a project, I mean, it's gonna explode. You know, it's like people will be doing everything all over the place, and you can't find anything, and you spend a lot of time to the point where the project actually cannot take any more projects and projects don't get finished 
simply because you can't organize it. And the idea is that, um, you know, even if you had like unlimited overhead resources, it would be just impossible to to uh, to keep track of, you know, 150,000 items, you know, stuff like that. So so the idea is try to get a taxonomy in place, understand the development spreadsheet and the, the module breakdown, and then you can find just about anything. But we have to spend that little bit of time, like what I talked to you about in the last 30 minutes, everyone pretty much has to master that in order for the project to scale. So what I'll do probably is do like a much more tight video explaining all this. Right now I, I just I explain it all to you how it works. And that's where we are in the current state of the project as far as how to make tons of people work together at the same time. As I said, like in the beginning of the project, we set up all the different machines on the wiki. You know, there were 50 of them and it, you know, we all felt great. And then the first, you know, the first time that you start going to new versions um, or more people come on, it starts to explode and implode basically because, okay, someone now just started a new version of, of a project so it's like we lost it there you know it's like because you really have to like every time you do a new version you really have to fork the project meaning you have to copy like like start again from where you were before and bring old material into it but then start a new clear page because otherwise you'd be confusing which which belongs to which version so that's why when that's that's why what I told you works well with that. You say, okay, we've got first it's the machine. You go to the genealogy for that machine, and then you click on the right version. And then for that version, the whole development process is repeated. Because every time you do it, it's like new things happen. So you have to track all the stuff that was done before. You can simply link to former work. But when you're starting a new project, you have to you have to set up the full infrastructure, documentation infrastructure for the new project to to have placeholders for all the development items. So, I mean, that's kind of the big overview. And, and I'll keep keep, um, you know, keep teaching about this and, and talking about this because it, you know, as we get new people, we have to teach them again and so forth. But but if you guys get that, you know, all of us can start teaching new people so that you know it's like okay we've got a project we've got the module here's where you find it here's your logs here's the critical path and timelines and and so forth so it becomes manageable it's kind of like hard to get up front but it's just we got to get that organizational framework in our mind so that we can scale in a major way down the road uh jonathan any comments to add to that um anything because then we just want to get right back to the to the development on the 3d printer um no, I think that's, uh, I mean, I know there's a lot of content and definitely being able to review. Uh, I think the other aspect of that is being able to get everybody uh, up to speed. I know for myself, i got to take the test and, and get that out of the way. Yeah. But uh, I was going to also comment on uh, Emmanuel, if there are, are any videos or tips that he could actually record uh, in terms of the new stuff that he's learned on FreeCAD, that'd be, that'd be pretty cool if he has time for that. But if not, that's understandable. Uh, videos of what I'm doing on FreeCAD? Right. Um, Martin said that you've, uh, I guess, has progressed fairly well, and, and if there are some tips and things that you can share, like, like a five-minute video, some things you learned about FreeCAD. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you said you, you, I, drew, you did a video or two, didn't you? It's, I, it's on my YouTube channel. Okay. I, just, I didn't post it on the wiki yet. I don't, okay. I don't know where to put the link. No, just put I it in. Them. So here's one example. Where do you put the link? Where do you put the link? Uh, no, I get because I don't know where I should put it. Well, that's my uh, point. You got to know where to put it, and that's the answer is in your log. So, so the, that's part of the thing. Is whatever anybody does, put everything on your log. That's that's the bottom line. So if you don't know where to put it, put it on your log because that's a, that's a good place. We know that people keep logs, and if someone understands how the wiki is organized a little better than you do then that person can organize that somewhere else. But the point is, first, dump all the content onto the wiki. Second, we can organize it. And the place to dump it all is, is simply your log. That's a good way to look at it, um, because that way we don't lose information. Because basically, I mean, the, the fact is, in term, with reference to global collaboration, if it's not on the wiki, it doesn't exist. Because it's like, okay, if we have the wiki as our collaboration platform, 
you can't tell people oh go that here there there and there and there to find the stuff that's too complicated that's why we're saying okay the wiki it's got all the stuff on it and it can take you to many other places but there's got to be one place where that can be done and we already know that that the largest uh, open source project in the world uses wiki media wiki that's wikipedia i mean that that's a proven technology it works it's fully scalable to pretty much unlimited development so just put it on your log and then we can talk about organizing that further down the road so that's you know that's one application of of using the wiki and kind of skill set that we want to develop in everybody yeah any other comments uh yeah it was a pretty good overview guy um taking it in but yeah i probably have to spend some time maybe watch it again and and kind of go through it familiarize myself with all the, the modules and kind of how to navigate but uh but yeah overall it's, um yeah uh, i was able to pick up a lot yeah that's great and i guess it turns out that i, I kind of when i was presenting this it took me like 30 minutes well i think i could probably shrink it down to like five minutes or 10 minutes in a super tight video that doesn't miss any of the important points so I'll, I'll i'll end up doing that that'll be a good task because this is really really critical I, just like i did the five minute video for freecad two of them we need like this five minute here's how you know everything about the project video super tight you know people can watch it i think the the short length like just from my perspective is important because then you can go through it really quickly and it should be an interactive video we know how to do interactive videos with youtube you can put links on the video and then you can put supporting like oh, okay here's a link to the development template you can have all those links right there so it takes a little bit of time to make that little video but it shouldn't be taken um like a half an hour which is what i did right now my, my apologies <laughs> but really it's like the the answer is well i didn't have a time the time to make a five minute video so i did an hour video right that's that's really what it is it takes time to distill the information down for rapid learning uh, but that's the kind of discipline we want to develop in everybody in a project so that when anyone comes to this they know this is the our our value is effective rapid learning you know and that's how you know we can invite many more people down the line with our promise which i already make very explicit we're not wasting people's time we're here to, for some high power development you know so that's that's kind of the the deal okay so so the learning for me is i definitely got to do this this video basically taking this and compressing this writing a script and then compressing this down to like five minutes which would be great okay so uh without further ado let's let's kind of get back to the work and we're saying so so everybody meet um richard who's who's helping on the hr we're actually going to interview another person on hr jose uh this week he he responded uh, we actually were supposed to get a meeting with him a long time ago, but we'll continue that. We'll continue building up the team. And, and Richard, this is useful for you just so you understand how this works. So when you are recruiting people, you, you have a good idea of you know, where, what the deal is here with the project. So without further ado, right. so let's go back to, right to the 3D printer um, on that development work. I mean, Richard, feel free to stay on or if you want to, if you got other things, you can, um, you can go to other things as well. But as far as the 3D printer, so last week we've um, we've prototyped the the frame, uh, or more like no more the axis, the the magnetic attachment of the axis. So we're actually doing quite well. I'm gonna let's see. I'm gonna see lower my. Can I share my screen now? I can. So I want to show you where we at in terms of uh, just just explain where we are. You guys can see it. Can you guys see it? Like I want to yes. show. It. Yep. So last week this this was the major accomplishment um this magnets on our universal axis pieces what's a universal axis it's an x y or z movement axis on a 3d printer works great i'm very encouraged we simply uh poked out little holes in the free cat so this is we took the existing file we put little holes in it put magnets in it works beautifully uh for example right there i'm picking up that whole metal box by that uh the the printed piece with my hand the the metal weighs it's only seven pounds uh, but each of these magnets is eight pounds of force so if you got like eight times six it's almost like 50 pounds of pull you know pull force uh, per one one piece and then once you have two of them attached that makes it much stiffer and in fact the way we do it the axis system uh, there's going to be like a transverse axis to that and so forth so it's going to be very strong we're going to have to make sure that it's it's solid, but the idea there is construction set. 
you take the same model, you can expand the frame to any size, shape, and form. So that's the beauty. Uh, also, check this out. It's, it, it leaves room for a very interesting way to add things like end stops. End stops, which are the things that, that the computer, the, the 3D printer detects that you're at the limit of a, of a motion axis. Stop geometry. Okay. So I did a little video on that, but basically... Uh, mount the end stop. Yeah. Right here. Mount the end stop. And the concept there is just use one of the magnets, put a little frame around this end stop thing, and mount it to the frame. Mount, mount it to the, the blue piece here, just using a magnetic attachment, which the magnetic attachment is one piece plus two magnets. Awesome. And, that, and the end stop fits right into that. Before we had this other thing where you had this end stop, it had three screws, uh, two nuts, three, three nuts, three screws, one end stop, like, and then a printed piece. So we're reducing parts count from like, like eight pieces to three pieces, so forth. But the magnetic way is really effective. So I like this here. And then I actually thought about this. We, we should put the end stop not on this side, but on the other side, because here it's tight by the motor. Here we have all the space with two magnet holes, like if we cover that. Uh, who popped off there? Um, Richard popped off, so maybe Richard. he... Okay, that's fine. So um, on the end stop piece here, we want to use the basically mount a little frame for the end stop and, and put it on, um, on this piece here. Uh, that would be a good thing to start with for this week because uh, we're kind of already jumping ahead to the end stops, which are, you know, uh, that's on a roadmap. If you look at the critical path, so, so D3D, if you go to D3D page, uh, there should be a critical path there. And basically we set, set up a week, week for each element. It's loading. Uh, but if we go to the critical path, there it is. Okay, so like you see, uh, I'm gonna go into edit mode here. But frame is like we have. Let's let's review that. Like Feb we're at February 20, and the idea there was for February 20. Let me expand this a little bit here. For February 20, we're looking at the controller software yeah that's a big big deal um because um and then heated bed end stops that's like down the, down the road but we, we can actually put these end stops here um let's make the end stops and controller happen this week what i can do on a controller is i've got the rambo mini which is the industry standard for the best printers the prusa i3 uses it the lulzbot mini uses it lulzbot computer uh, 3d printers use that so the Rambo Mini, uh, this one controller board, is the choice to go. It's it costs quite a bit. It costs 120 bucks off the shelf. So we want to do a parallel route of a controller that's both the um, the Rambo turnkey, which which you know they've already got everything in there, and then do the open source one. And it starts with a wiring strategy that I I think what I want to do is maybe go through that a little bit uh, for everybody here. Um, but maybe, um, you know, one very useful thing that we can do if we talked about, because we talked about the frame on February 13, um, where's the extruder? Extruder was February, like the first thing, like February 6 or so. That was the first thing we, we did. And we kind of nailed it in a sense that we're going to just get a regular low cost extruder off the internet. Uh, if we have time later on extruder, we can go back to it and do the Prusa i3 mk2 extruder which is more powerful but for now i mean that's that was our window of opportunity we got to move on here so we've got the universal axis that's working well um but maybe the thing is um we can probably stretch the universal axis here into this week a little bit in a sense of we want to draw a complete 3d printer as is right now so maybe uh emmanuel maybe we can task you with that task because that would be a cer certainly a thing we can do so draw the frame draw all the axis elements draw the extruder mount and the end stops uh, with the end stops as I mentioned they have to be designed um, so that that would be a big task would, would you be able to do that you think uh, yeah can, can you just um, uh, so uh, let me yeah yeah let's do that uh, so, so yeah 
no no screws no no let's let's just put i mean i've the idea there is the magnets we can get off the shelf for 30 cents each so if we use two magnets um well actually it would be four magnets because you need two magnets on a carriage and two magnets on 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 the extruder mount so it costs you a dollar twenty to mount an end stop i think that's acceptable and that's at just uh, uh yeah the end stop uh, is it is on a, on a board right how this yeah will mount on the right on so the so here if you look at this one right here um let's mount it so if you look at let's see which is the piece um let's go to our document the best way to do it is look at our document so so take a look at so this piece here let's mount them on the piece opposite of the motor side because there's all the real estate there there is nothing on that outside of the idler right so we have a lot of space there we already have the the holes for the magnets on that piece so we can put a linear strut basically like a little platform for this and basically mount it right there so let's just simply draw that up i'm going to take a little screenshot of that um if you guys can do that i'll beat you to it i'll do a little screenshot of this and let's work with this as the next let's continue working on it because there's already some work on that in our current working document so tell me where do i find the current working document on the frame do you remember well we can go to d3d to for an index go to the modules for, there's the d3d frame hey there you go let's let's try that so there's the frame uh, here's the working doc. There you go. So we already started. So D3D frame, uh, a lot of this stuff is already documented. So let's take a look at that, that doc. So I've thought about this. Like I already looked at this um, as like this. Just mount this there, put this on a little platform. And then if you did it right there, I was thinking about the end stop on motor carriage on motor side um, but after I thought about it the other side is empty so I'm gonna put a cross through that on the other side or yeah put it the motor side uh, no let's go let's go to the next one let's put it let's put it there let's put it on there new end stop location so put them right there. You see that those holes? Like maybe put them. Okay. So you see that pattern? There's three three bolts right there. You see that? Yeah. Um, well, we could use that one. So what we could do is do something like. Um, do like a little thing that's like there maybe. Uh, make that transparent make that visible so maybe put the end stop mount there and then the end stop itself little end stop would be something like that and it, what you want to do is probably have it such that it's got a little rail so you just slide it in and it kind of snip snaps into place so I'll make that maybe black okay. I, I need the end exact stop. dimensions yeah end so where stop. do you find the end stop Google it and, and get a 3D CAD file of it. I'm sure we can find an end stop from some free CAD file. I'm sure somebody's put an end stop into one of their. I mean, there's a lot of different 3D printer um, okay. designs so out there. Just an end stop because, because on the on the picture I can see it's not just an end stop. It has its own board. Yeah, those boards. Jonathan, fill them in on that. Yeah. I'm using just the switch, the regular black switch, or... Right, or right. The deal is... You know. um, okay. Because those those are already turnkey items that are found off the shelf, use this whole thing. You can get it on eBay. So, so standard end stops. So you go look at um, end stop eBay. End stops uh, Amazon. 3DP. Okay. Uh, and you'll find them. They're going to be like a couple of dollars each. 
Uh, I'm I'm starting to use Duck 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 Go actually. It's pretty cool. You know Duck Duck Go, like this for example. Yes. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Emmanuel, you know Duck Duck Go? No. Uh, type in Duck Duck Go into your browser and start using it. <laughs> it's an open. It's a, private, it's a, it's a search engine that it doesn't track all your stuff. It's a. It's a. Tr is it an open source engine too, or is it closed source? Uh, I'm not sure if it's open source or not. I think it's just a matter of a privacy. Yeah, privacy. Yeah. So anyway, here's a an end stop from Amazon, so I can put it into the working document right there. I'll put the link to it. Um, so I put the link in there. That's the st oh, disappeared. Use that the standard end stop off the shelf. Those are very standard. Everyone has them, and everyone uses them. So let's not, you know, invent anything there for now. And okay. therefore, Do you have that? yeah. Okay. Uh, so what I would suggest is that we use these two holes here. So you got those uh, little magnet holes that uh, are here. That one. Uh, let me fill that with blue. So maybe use that hole right there and use that little hole right there and mount that little little plastic piece on it with magnets. So basically the bottom of the plastic piece is magnet holes and there's already the magnet holes on the the end, the end piece. Does that make sense? Yeah, just if, if you have that item uh, uh, with you, just keep it Give me the dimensions because I don't know if I will be able to find them online. Uh, the what? The um, the end stop? Yes. Yeah. So I can make a box, a red box you have, uh, so it yeah. will just pop in. Yeah, I don't, I don't have a because diagram of it because I, I mean, I, I can measure it, but okay, no, no, no let's okay. Google that. Like, uh, no, you can find it. You can find it. So end stops diagrams 3dp there's going to be dimensions on there um images which what's useful is you just click on images and then you probably find a diagram okay. somewhere i will do my research again yeah 3dp and stops diagrams See if images come up. Yeah, like like. Um, yeah, I'm not finding any. But do that. Do that research. I bet you there's different end stop holders and like, probably no. Just you just gotta find the dimensions. Cause uh, I mean I could measure the dimensions for you, but oh, like right there maybe. Is that there? I don't know. No, maybe not. But you'll find it. Uh, I can measure them, but they're not going to be as accurate probably as the sources. Like, best thing would be to go to like a really decent online store that sells end stops, like Adafruit, for example. Like, or not Adafruit, but maybe yeah, Adafruit or SparkFun. Um, SparkFun should probably have a diagram, technical drawing of that. Um, SparkFun Electronics. So let's look up. On their site let's see if they have an end stop between them and adafruit you know adafruit industries have you heard of those guys um, no. I'm, I'm pretty interested in okay uh, so spark fun you can take a look at that I'm gonna look at 3d printer and stop and we can find it somewhere. Uh, my question is, if we, where are we going to actually uh, buy, source this item? Because from each one of us, it can be different dimensions. Yeah, yeah. I already linked it to that document there, like right here in this document. Um, standard end stop. Click on that. Amazon. <clears throat> Those are standard, so, standard dimensions. So just use that. Yeah, but just okay. find find somewhere where it has that. I mean, between rep wrap. So Adafruit is like Adafruit.com. I may end up 
buy this also. I will have a 3D printer here on my own. <laughs> look, you've got end stops on your own 3D printer. Just look at those. Those are this, probably going to be the uh, same. I have the regular black switch for end stops. Oh, just... It's, no, not, it's not on a board? No, it's just regular. Okay. Just so see that Adafruit there? Adafruit Industries. That's that's a good site. They're open source. Adafruit and Sparkthon are the largest open source businesses in the world for hardware. Okay. They're the biggest ones. They're the most known ones. And then, then Lulzbot, I think, is coming up to exceed all of them probably by the, the this year. Because uh, Lulzbot is... Lulzbot. Um, it the, might be on the yeah, but you, yeah, okay. shouldn't be a problem. Just do a little bit of research on that. You'll you'll find a diagram somewhere. Um, it just yeah, takes a little. And then so do like can... a. Do you see this here? Like do a little snap in thing, or like you slide it in or snap it in. Okay. Uh, probably like slide it in. You can. You can probably like once you get a detailed mm -hmm. image of that thing, just look at a detailed image. And I would really suggest FreeCAD. There's someone's gonna have that in the, in their in their FreeCAD file of okay. a 3D printer. Uh, probably Lulzbot might have I... a, an image of that. Cause uh, well, actually, no. Lulzbot uses their own custom ones, so no, they won't. Um, so yeah, yeah, do that. So uh, so so do that. Mount the end stop, and then build the frame. So the frame is going to be like this, 16 inches by 2 inches wide. Uh, it's like this in the next picture. Two in so it's right here. That's what the frame is going to look like. Just start with a 16 inch by 16 inch, the green one here. Yeah. And uh, draw that up. It's plain, simple, square stuff. Put it all together. Uh, probably five sides, maybe leave the top side open. Or maybe not, maybe just close the top side too. Just close the top side as well. So use six pieces, make a frame, put on all your axes with stepper motors, put on the extruder and the end stops, and that's that could be our product for the, the week. Uh, that, that probably will take you 10 hours total to do. And you think you're finished with the, um, so you did well on the, um, your own, let's see, look at Manolis, Manolis log. And see what you got because you did the you already did the the holder for the extruder because um, the extruder is looks like this uh, where is the extruder this this extruder here it's a very simple extruder you can get off the shelf anywhere in fact let me link to that for for reference um, 3d printer extruder Three D printer extruder eBay. Um, okay, we're running out of time here. I'm actually gonna go, but but you can look at the three D printer extruder. Like yeah, it's like one like this. Um, there's many different ones that are available like this. So if you do like MK8 extruder uh, kind of deal, you find a lot of these extruders online. Uh, so Google that on eBay. Um, okay, good. So back to this document. The extruder is mounted magnetically on a little magnetic holder. And let's just show that to everybody. Motor interface. Is that what it is? The, the interface? Is that your file there? So we're going to save that as motor interface. Uh, Emmanuel, that's the file, right? Yeah, yeah. Yep, so you download that onto your desktop and then you you go to your magical open source FreeCAD software. So that got downloaded. I'm going to open did, did, did you see that I changed it? Did you did you see that new thing? Uh according to the wiki there's only one version. Did you use upload a new version of this file? So I'm opening up the motor interface thing right now, which is the thing that the extruder motor snaps into, and on its back it's got magnets, so it so it attaches to the carriage. So it's a magnetic mount. 
So you can ha do quick interchange between your extruder, maybe a little engraver or laser, or router. For a router, you would need more force to hold because the magnets, if you'd use a little router, the magnets may not be adequate for that. Uh, so we, we would have to probably revisit. Well, I mean, the simple answer is just using more magnets because you can get some of these really, really strong, like each one of them is like, they're literally dangerous if you get your hand stuck under a magnet when it's pinching to metal. I mean, you'll crush your finger. Okay, so this is a uh, this is the mount. So the back, very nice. I think that looks pretty nice. Oh wow, that looks professional, man. Look at this. So that's free CAD. So, that looks good to me. Yep. And then it's this a less, less mass. So it's and um, let's see, and it mounts like this this way. So you, this is like. Well, in okay, the so white stuff goes down. white is down. It's white like this, goes down. White like side. this. So now it's upside down. Right. So it goes like this. Yep. Which makes sense. It's holding that by gravity, and it's got pinching holes, yep. bolts there. So we basically so, clamp the motor in place. Uh, right. So in order to no, okay, sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, in order not to introduce any more uh, materials. Yep. I. I saw that you have on your bill of material some uh, Phillips screws. Yep. Uh, 20 mm, and I think they fit perfect there. So it's not the socket, the you know the Allen key you said in the beginning. Uh huh. Why not? Uh, because we will need to to add more more uh, items. Okay. Okay. Uh, Different, yeah, you know, whichever s screw works there that we're using already, so we're not adding any additional parts count to the overall bill of materials, that would be good. Okay, excellent. So that looks like a good solution for the, the motor mount, the extruder mount. Excellent. And um, we can go on. So so you th would you say you have everything you need to get going on a frame with extruder, with um, the full um, carriages and rods? I will start with very easy stuff. And yeah. If we have to uh, solve the issue with a uh, mind platform, and I will ask you there. Okay. The yeah, yeah. I'm aiming to solve that today. I called up called up Bill from Minds because we gotta get the approvals. Basically, uh, new member okay, so approvals. Uh -huh. You need the uh, uh, for this week. Make 3D cut files for for the frame. Yeah, correct? frame with the axes and everything because that's what we're actually going to build so we're pretty good on the 16 inch version that gets us at least an 8 by 8 working surface so that's good i'll get working on the uh, controller part and fill you guys in on where i'm on that but i came up with a very nice i mean okay let me just summarize that in the next two minutes um as you can imagine the wiring for a 3d printer is pretty messy it's got about 50 or 60 individual wires if you count them up. So the strategy here is to make plug connectors that go in through CAT5 because each CAT5 cable has eight wires inside of it. So uh, the, if the total number of wires is about, about 50 in the original way that the, the, the controllers are designed by a strategy of using common grounds and routing everything through cat fives we can reduce 50 wires to as little as three three eight eight conductor wires and it's uh and i'm going to draw that out for you it sounds magical yeah it, it sounds good uh, but basically reduce the massive massive confusion on the controller by you still have to make all those 50 connections on the controller but once you make those little plugs, they all go into Cat5 wire where it's simple, uh, basically, Cat5 jacks and Cat5 wires, which which when you actually go, the way it works is, uh, just if I tr can try to describe it, you're going, for example, with that one wire to one stepper motor. At the stepper motor, you do a doubler, which is a standard dollar part. Uh, uh, an RJ45 jack that has one plug in and two coming out. 
and one, one wire goes to one extruder motor and the next wire continues on to the next one. So you can have one Cat5 wire, for example, do two motors if they require four wires each, but it gets much better than that for the end stops, for the fans, uh, say the end stops and sensors. If there's three end stops, three sensors, two sensors for the thermistors, one sensor for height. So what I told you right now, there's six different items. Those six items, if they have a common ground, can go through a single Cat5. So what you do there, you go with one Cat5 to one end stop, you do the doubler, you connect to that end stop and continue to go into the other end stop, to the third end stop, you, you do a doubler at each component, and that component, then you go to the, to the sensors, and essentially one Cat5 out of your controller gets you up to eight devices. Here I named six devices with this example. But that's as good as it, as good as it gets when you um, simply wire up the connectors, the Cat5 connectors, from the controller in a certain way that a single Cat5, just a universal one, just you take a Cat5 with RJ45 male jacks on either, either end, those are what's carrying um, all the signals and power. So very interesting. I'm going to draw that up today so that even when we do the Rambo Mini, we can have this simplified wire harness that consists of, instead of tens of wires, we have three or four. Uh, there's some questions I have. I might be able to get it down to three wires, three Cat 5s. Uh, I might need to use four, and at worst case, five. So uh, I'll draw that up today in the next couple of hours uh, when I have time. Uh, I'm going to work on that right now. Now, Jonathan, that leaves you completely unemployed on a project. What are your thoughts? <laughs> So, oh, say that again. Jonathan, that leaves you completely unemployed as far as tasks that you can do. What What do we have for you to, this week? Um, well, I mean, as far as the, the cable management stuff, I mean, I can definitely help with that. Yeah. Wiring and metal. Yeah, that's maybe we, we can uh, work on that. So I'll produce that document and see if you can pr provide any feedback. Because otherwise, there's the CAD stuff that, uh, that Emmanuel is doing that's going really well. And then we have to find some tasks for Brian... Uh, who can watch this video um, but for Brian uh, please watch this and then uh, we can talk after that but yeah so uh, what I'll do right now is uh, once I get my bearings around the controller we can maybe dole out some tasks on that but I'll, I'll get the first draft of that and then we can um, can do the controller the useful thing would be for all of us I mean I don't know if you can get yourself a Rambo Mini and actually prototype this wiring because the next step would be like hopefully by this week I've got the Rambo here already so I can make all the connectors with an RJ45 crimper uh, just a, basically a cat5 wire crimper I can make all those end connectors that's just like a $10 or $20 uh, crimper that you make <clears throat> the cat5 wires with the Ethernet wires with um, but it would be useful if all of us could prototype this so if you could get your hands on, I mean, maybe if you can print one of the axes for yourself, Jonathan, and then okay. get yourself the controller, then you can, then we can all test the axes in parallel. And I mean, the axes are not too expensive. They're pretty, pretty affordable. So what I would suggest for you, Jonathan, is, uh, and also for Brian, if you guys can print out the axis parts and get yourself some magnets, motors, rods, and then just a little the pieces for the axis. Each axis costs. Um, I didn't do the math on that, but it's about about twenty dollars, twenty thirty dollars for each axis. But if you make yourself one axis, then you can actually start testing the controller that the wiring scheme is actually working. Because to work out the wiring, I mean, I think that's a nice breakthrough. Because I mean, you look at any controller right now for the three D printers, they're just a whole crow's nest of wires. And if we can reduce that by making the proper connections happen and just go through like th four Cat5 wires, there'll be a major advancement for the state of art in 3D printing, I think. So so we should definitely try for that. And, and why don't people think like that? Well, I don't think a lot of people are thinking about a modular 
design set, we're thinking about this like this with a modular quick connects because we want to modify these things like crazy. So for us, it's we do construction sets. We don't do dedicated machines, so we definitely want to do this. But if we do do this, that could be a great contribution. So I think I'll end at that, and um, I'll say I'll, I'll start drawing that up and definitely print yourself out an axis, look at the documentation that we have, and that would actually be a test of whether you can find all the documentation. So print yourself an axis, get the magnets, get the motors and rods, and uh, test, get yourself a Rambo Mini, which is, uh, it's not cheap though, that's, that's the problem. So be maybe before you get the Rambo Mini, we can possibly disperse that task by saying, okay, we just do the Arduino route, because in parallel to the Rambo Mini, which is what we're going to go with full force right now, we can also do the, the simple... Get yourself an Arduino for 10 bucks, Arduino clone. Get yourself three stepper drivers, which are about eight bucks each. And then get a couple of solenoid drivers, uh, like the cheap ones we used, the regular ones like we used in the Aquatonic Greenhouse. And that's all you need to control everything. So it's bas basically about $60, 60 to $80 in parts, whereas the Rambo Mini costs 120 just for that Rambo Mini. So we can do a, a controller that's many times more powerful and twice as cheap as the Rambo Mini. Um, it's also infinitely scalable because you can put as many um, channels on that as, as, as needed. So I would say let uh, hold on to the controller until I get the initial draft so we can get a clear direction on who's going to do the Rambo Mini route versus the, the from scratch route using a, a basically an Arduino with three of these more powerful stepper drivers that you, get, that you can get on eBay. So let's do that. But yeah, everybody print the axes and get those going. Get yourself the magnets so you can see see how that is. And the, and the frame itself, um, it's not too expensive if you can get it CNC cut. I'm actually going to get that quote out to some fab shops. But the material cost itself is $50 if you make a single frame. If you nest it to three frames, then that price goes down to 17 if you're cutting out three nested frames, as in a frame document. So... Um, you can make yourself, um, you can do that too. We, we encourage anybody to actually do that through a local CNC shop to cut out the frame. Or you can just take flat steel and cut out by hand, but that's kind of messy. You want a nice clean cut. You can do it by hand if you want to prototype it and do it low brow, but for production we're going to definitely get it CNC cut. So I think that's about it for now. And uh, So I think, uh, Emmanuel, you, I think we're pretty clear on the... Now, we want to document this, so D3D... So, the, so where do we put this, the tasks? Can someone answer? Yep, that's right. Where else but on a D3D log? So we go to the D3D log, and I'll just... Uh, uh, I'm not going to do it right now because I'm pretty... I, I will, I will. But basically the process manager, the part that's missing from this team, the process manager should be recording all that we're talking about here. They should be, for example, writing down, okay, the task allocation was such and such. For the meeting and right now i'm doing that but we need more people on the team to to make this flow smoothly to the point where we can literally design a full product on a, like a week time scale with 144 people <laughs> i mean that'd be crazy um but that's the idea so richard we got some interview frame so entire frame for emmanuel uh controller will hold on um jonathan Print axis. And help on controller. Brian, definitely if you can get yourself access to a 3D printer, print the axis. I'm not sure if you actually have one. I didn't ask you that. Print axis. Um, and start prototyping so that uh, what I'll do is the controller diagram, including the the Arduino route. Controller diagram Rambo Mini including the Arduino route for a lower cost version. With Arduino we just have to work out a little few more things whereas the Rambo Mini it's already all set for running things so for lower cost. Yeah so that's that's a general task breakdown we could of course written more details on that but that's the general thing. So I think that's it. Anything else? Yeah, question. Yep. 
you said something that the nut cutter was some of them were more white or uh, nut catchers well i mean a nut oh yeah 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 uh the idea there was and i think where did i put that um i used back yeah i put a note back on the osc workshops page i think unless i put it here in the comments yeah, I I, I showed it somewhere. yeah it's in the comments so let me open up these comments here no it's not this doc. Um, yeah, let me show you what what we mean there. But yeah, little detail. We got to reduce those hole sizes just a little bit there on the nut catcher part. But all of them are because I saw some nuts were tight, some were loose. But I, I, I didn't make that sketch. I don't know who made it. I, I, I cannot understand. Should I redo that sketch? Uh, okay, yeah, there it is. There it is. So what you see there like that picture right there uh, I can, let's I cannot see your screen oh let me uh, share it let me share my screen there so share screen That should be right here. Okay. Um, bug report. So we're using this as our bug report uh, on the the OSC network. Yeah. Uh, so this is the page that I cannot uh, see, right? Right. So so here on the right hand side, that's fine because those are round, right? But these ones. You know, like that one there, that seems to be fitting tight. But that one, you see it's loose. This is loose. This is loose-ish. I mean, it's somewhat works, but it can let go. So reduce those. Yeah, everyone. Make every one of those the same size. From this picture, it actually appears that this one is smaller. That picture looks like that one is smaller. So yeah, it was not drawn that accurately in FreeCAD. And I think you got the basic constraints there in FreeCAD. You might want to catch yourself like a five minute video showing how you change that because that's basically what we want to do for the design guide is show people, okay, here are the files, here's how you manipulate them in FreeCAD, and that's a simple little yeah. five minute okay. video. So do that. But change both sides while making sure that the head right there still yeah. can fit. And how do you know those so, what those bolts are? We yeah. know the exact specific... No, I will see what nuts, I don't remember what nut size there are, but okay. I will okay. see the, the universal axis. Right. We have a BOM for the universal yeah. CNC axis, right? Look at this, right okay. here. So I will, I will record how I will uh, make the sketch. Right? Yes. So Most likely I will make it from the beginning because it has, I saw the sketch, it has about 120 constraints. That's crazy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you know what time it is with your stuff. That's right. So here on the Universal CNC Access page on the wiki, you can get the exact specs of those bolts because the BOM for the Universal Access, I'm on the Universal Access page here, that's online there. So you can find the exact bolts that we're using because they're from a master car and they have the full CAD files. So you can know exactly what to make that hole size there. Okay. Excellent. So with that said, I think that's about all, right? Anything else? That's it. Jonathan, anything else? You said hold up on the Rambo, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, you can hold on to on, but um, if you wanna, if you have the extra money, you should get it too to get familiar with it. So that, uh, I mean, the idea there is Rambo is the universal controller that the two of the top open source printers in the world use, and that's the Prusai 3 Original and the Lulzbot Mini, and uh, they both use uh, the Rambo. We should be familiar with it just to study the industry standards. So if you would like to learn more about the industry standards, you should get it. But if you want to go straight to the uh, to the open source, like the the from scratch version, then you can do that too. 
I think, I mean, I would recommend it if you have the money because we definitely want to uh, understand that inside out, kind of how it works so we can take it off from there because if we can make the universal wiring harness, we could, what we should be doing is offering the universal wiring harness that can also be retrofitted to the Rambo Mini so that anyone who has a Rambo Mini, they can simplify their wiring like you know tenfold so that'll be a service to the community even though we're going with the uh the arduino route we should also make it interoperable with the rambo mini so that's the idea there why why i would suggest getting it too um, okay i'll up, look into it and, uh, it's up to you as far as the, the, route, the other route that we're looking at the open source route the uh, we need arduino or are we going to go straight from to design simple right right the idea there is idea there is to go from eBay Amazon sourceable parts so you got an Arduino you got three of those stepper drivers and you got one of those solenoid drivers like you saw for the aquaponic greenhouse um, those can be readily mounted on another board what i'm thinking is that we can even put the magnetic mounts on that and just attach it to the metal frame you know so we have complete access for flexibility but the idea there is um, no need to make a dedicated board because all you need is wiring to connect the three items together so what we probably would do is do a a cat5 shield for an arduino and then use that to make all the connections to the other things uh, i haven't looked at a cat5 shield uh, but that would be the route to go so that we can go from the arduino instead of using like 10 different types of connectors we got one cat5 where the challenge the the work the bl brunt of the work is involved around making the connectors so you 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 make a cat5 connector socket but it's got a particular like that wire yeah yeah there's little details on how you wire that up so that you can use any you just use regular cat5 cables but the wiring inside the plugs that is actually correct so you're not blowing things up so there's little details exactly. there yeah, right but once we devise that methodology then anyone can use very simple wiring systems so but yeah it wouldn't be i wouldn't go for a dedicated board at this phase maybe down the road somewhere but the idea is for us you know because we're doing infinite scalability and all kinds of stuff we just leave it at separate pieces don't worry about getting a separate dedicated board which also applies to the brick press right now actually i think we want to go back to a, a very simple arduino and the solenoid drivers like we used before pending that we get the proper wiring harnesses because the the tough part about working with individual components is the is the wiring and that's why people make boards because then it's so easy to wire things up you know everything goes to the right place it, it makes things nice and ordered but if we put that complexity into the wiring scheme like with quick connect cat5 systems i think we can make a quite highly workable system there and that, and here of course i'm i'm uh, that's our theory right now which we want to test and if we find that none of this works, we can go to more standard routes. But of course, I mean, there's no reason why it, it wouldn't work. We have to work out um, the details and see how much of that kind of a wiring system we want to use. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So that's that's it. Um, yep. Yeah. Go modular as much as possible. So, so Manuel, I muted you there, but yeah, everything good. So. Okay, if everything is good to go, uh, then we can continue and we'll close it off right here. So I'm going to stop the recording. For anyone else else wants to get involved, please um, sign up as a OSC developer. That means we interview you and we become part of the team. Otherwise, you can uh, view this video and see uh, see what we're doing. Thank you.